Racing the Lagoon is a 1999 Japan-only PlayStation 1 racing RPG hybrid developed by Square, directed by Sasaki Hitoshi, produced by Kawazu Akitoshi, and written by Toriyama Motomu, with programming led by Iwasaki Tatsuji, design led by Fujika Tsukasa, graphic design by Matsuo Takaharu, and music composed by Matsueda Noriko. The late 1990s was a time at Squaresoft of a character not seen before or since. The early 90s saw Square produce some of its most beloved and widely known projects. Final Fantasy IV, Final Fantasy V, Final Fantasy VI, Chrono Trigger. 1997 saw the release of Square's most popular game ever, Final Fantasy VII, which brought the series to unprecedented levels of pop culture relevance both in and outside of Japan. Alongside and after Final Fantasy VII, however, Square was not resting on its laurels. This era produced some of the strangest games in the company's history, original titles like Parasite Eve and Vagrant Story, alongside mold-breaking entries in existing series like Saga Frontier and Chrono Cross. Even by the standards of late 90s Square, however, Racing Lagoon is unaccountably strange. It is, as its name would suggest, a racing game. While it fails to live up to the high standards of PS1 racing games set by Gran Turismo 2 and Ridge Racer Type 4, it holds its own as an enjoyable arcade racing experience. What it brings that Gran Turismo and Ridge Racer could never dream of is a fully-fledged Japanese role-playing game experience, developed by the Final Fantasy people at near the peak of their powers. Racing Lagoon was directed by Sasaki Hitoshi, who had previously worked in the similarly titled, but very different, Super Famicom RPG Bahamut Lagoon. Lead designer duties were taken up by Fujita Tsukasa, who had previously worked on Final Fantasy Tactics. Production was handled by Akitoshi Kawazu, a lead developer of Square's criminally underrated Saga series. The game's completely hog-bonkers script was handled by Toriyama Motomu, who had previously worked on Bahamut Lagoon and Final Fantasy VII, and would go on to direct such oddities as Final Fantasy X-2 and Lightning Returns Final Fantasy XIII. Racing Lagoon was never released outside of Japan, but over 20 years after its release, a team of hackers and translators led by Hilltop and featuring translation by Pancake Taicho, Kendall, Mason, and Misty Hands, and hacking by Ombra, Solid Snake 11, and Envelica, released an English fan translation. This English fan translation is what I will be showing off today. So, without further ado, let's play Racing Lagoon. I start by naming my character Bong Cloud, which I have named all of my characters in every game I play for a number of years now. The game opens with a pre-rendered cutscene featuring text floating over the waters of Yokohama Bay in a way that, because my brain is broken, forcibly reminds me of Baz Luhrmann's 2013 Great Gatsby film adaptation. A text crawl then explains the story of Yokohama's fastest legend, a crazy driver who took hairpin turns in fifth gear. The first characters I see are Makoto and Akira of the Night Racers, a rival street racing team. Then. Big Lagoon Racing pulls up, led by Fujisawa Ikki and his bright red car. Then I finally see our protagonist, accompanied by comic relief weirdo Yamato Kenzo. I learn that Bong is making his street racing debut tonight with Bay Lagoon Racing, but Kenzo thinks this is inauspicious. We meet Kaki Jerkwad Keisuke, and we learn a very important piece of information. In Racing Lagoon, you race for keeps. When you win a race, you get to steal a part from the person that you beat. When you lose, you get a part stolen. When you're racing against multiple people, as in this event, you normally get assigned a rival, the person whose parts you can steal if you win, and who steals your parts if you lose. When the race starts, it becomes immediately apparent that I have scarcely a chance in hell of winning this race. I only have to beat Keisuke to avoid having my parts stolen, but even that requires a Herculean racing effort. I narrowly squeak past him in the second lap and retain my lead despite bumping into some walls. It's worth emphasizing just how possible it is to lose this race. In some lost footage of a first attempt at this playthrough, I did just that. And amazingly, the game simply continues on. Keisuke steals one of your parts and you get to keep playing. A few other racers we'll meet soon enough stand in awe, not of our performance, but of our team leader, Iki, who won the whole race outright. I get the opportunity to steal from Keisuke's car. I have no idea what I'm doing. I don't know anything about cars. I'm consulting an astonishingly exhaustive yet surprisingly useless guide which tells me to take Keisuke's spoiler. Bong Cloud basks in the glow of his own performance, and the prologue night comes to a close. Bong is shook up by the night he's just had. He gets a call from Kenzo, who says he's in trouble at the foreigner graveyard. Bong laments his inability to work his cell phone. Before I can pull out of the parking lot to go help Kenzo, Keisuke and Shinsuke pull up and block me in with their cars. They want to know where Iki is. I tell them to piss off. Keisuke makes... this... face. 
After telling me the race wasn't fair because of his allergies, Keisuke and Shinsuke peel out. After a panorama of the game world, I finally get control of the car. I barely drive a hundred feet before I'm harassed by some guy flashing his lights at me and the game introduces its random encounter system. Cars can flash their headlights and if you get caught in them, you have to race them. You can also flash your headlights in any car to force it to battle you. The guy in the car says that the night racers were spotted harassing a girl from Bay Lagoon Racing over the Ferris wheel. I get pulled into a single lap race with him that I narrowly win. I steal his engine, so I have no idea how he's getting home. I stop by the gas station and meet Namba Kyoji, another Bay Lagoon Racing Team member who works there. Bong reminisces about the good old days, working at the gas station with Kyoji and getting all greased up. Kyoji asks if I want a quote, quick GS. I go ahead and say yes, because I'm inclined to just pretend I understood what someone said when they say something insane to me. It turns out GS stands for both gas station and game save. Who knew? I head up to the Foreigner Graveyard, which is appropriately on Graveyard Street, to help Kenzo. Kenzo is surrounded by night racers, harassing him to find out where Iki is. We get into a race down Graveyard Street, which it turns out we don't actually have to win, which is good, because I spend most of the race smacking into walls. The night racers leave us alone, but we find out they've kidnapped Yuka. After the cutscene, I go to save my game. Kyoji says... This. Look, I have a request. Every time I save my game, in any game, I want this text box to appear. If the game auto saves, I just want this to pop up in the corner instead of the little symbol that you put up there and tell me I'm not supposed to turn off the console while it's showing. I just... It's perfect. I drive around looking for Keisuke's bright orange car. Eventually I find him and chase him across the city. I lose sight of him temporarily, but then he comes back into view and I flash him with my headlights. We have a race on the Bay Lagoon circuit, and just as I pass him, Makoto shows up and blows past both of us. We rescue Yuka, and I drive her home. The revenge race is set up. The opening act is going to be a one-on-one -on -one with me and Makoto. After the cutscene, I am immediately accosted by a woman named Aoyama Nanako, who tells me about unofficial races. Unofficial races are this game's version of side quests, and they usually have some kind of restriction as to what kind of cars can enter them. They will become highly relevant much later. I go to the gas station and talk to Kyoji. He gives me an ECU for my car. I had to look up what an ECU is, but apparently it stands for Electronic Control Unit. Afterwards, I drive around for a while and get into a few races. I do a few attempts at the Bay Lagoon unofficial races, but I don't make any progress, and eventually I find myself at Spencer's test course. I lose the 200 PS unofficial race there, but it feels close, so I spend some time doing attempts, but eventually I give up and go out on the hunt for new parts to make it easier. I hit the jackpot. A Danger V6 catches me in its headlights, and the guy that I was consulting informed me that it had the best engine available until considerably later in the game. It seemed impossible at first, but I pulled ahead by being more daring on the turns, and I squeaked past the finish line in first place. With my new engine, I cleared the FR Cup unofficial race in a few attempts. This imparted upon me the most significant lesson. It doesn't matter how bad you are at driving, if you have a good enough engine. I get the B Diet 30, a part that reduces the weight of your car, which would prove highly useful. Shortly thereafter, it's time to start the night's main event. I meet Aoi, Iki's girlfriend. She does, uh... This, for some reason. We have a conversation looking out over the water. I get into my race in Makoto. Even with my new engine, it's close, but I'm faster than him. My racing is sloppy, though. It takes me several attempts. Eventually, I pull ahead and stay ahead. As I'm coming down the final straightaway... Makoto flips his car. He gets taken off to the hospital. His dad shows up and we all get kicked out of the hospital room.
Bong says he needs to find Iki. I go to the mechanic that has Makoto's car. Iki isn't there, but the mechanic gives me Makoto's brake pads. I don't feel like I deserve them. I run into Kenzo at Yamashita Park. He told me he felt pretty bad after the accident. He's anxious about being behind the wheel. I decided to drive to Iki's apartment to see if he was there. Note that Iki's apartment is labeled F's Mansion. The F is for Fujisawa. Mansion in Japanese just means apartment complex or apartment. Iki's not there, but Aoi is. She gives me a, quote, rear diffuser, which I choose to interpret as not a euphemism. I head to the place where Makoto crashed. There was still glass on the road and the guardrail was bent where it had been hit. I eventually find Iki at a park on a hill overlooking Bay Lagoon on Graveyard Street. He talks to me about street racing and about his doubts in the face of Makoto's accident. He talks about his resolve to keep racing. A few nights later, Iki gets us all together. He says that he's been invited to the Yokohama Grand Prix, and that he's taking one of us with him. We all had a friendly race together. The crew takes off for North Yokohama. I go to the gas station to talk to Kyoji. Kyoji lets on that he's jealous of the rest of us for getting the race all the time instead of having to work. He tells me that his older brother died in a street racing accident 10 years ago. I drive to North Yokohama. I get ambushed by a street racing team from the area. I clobber them in a drag race, and then their leader, Tetsuji, gives me a gift for my good performance. I drive down to the Takashima Wharf. There I meet a group of racers who do chicken races to the end of the wharf. You go as fast as you can, and slam on the brakes as late as possible without going over the edge. Obviously, I have to get in on this. I fall into the water several times. Eventually, I kind of got the hang of it. Even more eventually, I realized that you could just install a manual transmission and stay in first gear the whole time for the most chicken shit victory possible. I made my way back to Bay Lagoon and called it a night. I get a call from Kenzo. He says he's worried about Kyoji. He says he's been meeting with Keisuke in secret. Kyoji and I are gonna race tonight to see who gets into the Yokohama GP. Before that though, Kenzo tells me about the Chinatown drag races. Turns out they aren't really drag races because they have turns. Also, I have no idea why anyone who lives or works in Chinatown hasn't kicked the ass of everyone who does this for constantly crashing into their storefronts. I cleanly sweep the tournament, but afterwards I get completely toasted by the leader of the Motomachi Queens. I'd let her kill me! After that, I headed to North Yokohama, where we're going to decide who was going to the Yokohama GP. I see KSK meeting with the Grand Tours, the drag race crew in North Yokohama, who I met last night. I'd spent a very long time trying to figure out what I was supposed to do this night to get to the race. I did more chicken races, I drove around flashing my headlights at Keisuke, I helped Kenzo out after he made a fool of himself in front of a bunch of hot ladies who apparently just stand around watching dudes take corners perfectly, I studiously read the guide I was consulting, and it still took me what felt like forever to actually get the race to start. I think I just needed to talk to Kenzo at this park after rescuing him about how Kyoji was planning to quit racing if he didn't get into the Yokohama GP. It was time for me to take on Kyoji. This was the first truly difficult race of the game. The course was tough, it started with this super hard hairpin turn, and I didn't know about the handbrake button yet, and it wound through a challenging chicane right near the end. When I beat him, Kyoji made this face. Something about defeating a man who had just yesterday given me the slightest glimpse of the deep despair he felt at his lack of racing success sucked the experience of any joy. Three nights later, and nobody has seen Kyoji. 
It's the night before the GP qualifier. I head to the gas station and there's a different guy there who told me Kyoji had been working at the gas station to save up money for work on his car. To improve my car for the GP, the walkthrough tells me to steal an engine from a certain car wandering around. I don't know what I'm doing wrong, but I never found this car. This night took the most real world time of any night because I kept spending like 20 minutes sitting around trying to find this car and I just never could. Instead, I'd save up money to buy the best engine available at Toon Shop Spencer. It isn't a great engine because it has no slots for upgrade parts, but it would be good enough to carry me through the GP qualifier. I return to Bay Lagoon. I stop the engine. Suddenly, I saw Kyoji. His car was different, his face was... Uh... He kept saying he was hearing a voice. He demanded a race. I capitulated. This race takes place at midnight, and apparently Bong saw fit to put on sunglasses because I could not see a thing. Fortunately, you don't have to win this race to move on. I didn't have time to dwell on Kyoji's weird behavior last night. It was the GP qualifier, which was the first race held during the day. It takes me over an hour of attempts, but I pull it off. I had to finish in the top two, and I finished second. After the GP qualifier, I see two men sitting in a darkened room watching the race on a projector. They say some ominous stuff about their test subject doing well. Bong gets a phone call from Yuka. She didn't sound like her usual self. She says they found Kyoji 7 in the ocean. He's dead. He drove through a guardrail in Bay Lagoon. There was no indication he'd even tried to stop. I watched him pull his car out of the bay. That same night, Makoto drew his last breath in his hospital bed. Iki, Yuka, Kenzo, and Bong mostly sit around in silence. Yuka tries to lighten the mood by bringing up a newspaper article about how we qualified for the GP. The wind gets sucked out of us when we notice an article about Kyoji's crash in the corner of the page. Bong tells the others about how Kyoji kept hearing a voice, and speculates about if this is connected to the car crashes ten years ago and the supposed curse of Yokohama's fastest legend. Iki wasn't having any of it. A racer from out of town pulls up. He wants to race Iki. Iki refuses. I go in his stead. The race is on the highway in the pouring rain. I win pretty easily. The dude I beat is a sore loser about it. He tells me to tell Iki that a guy named Miharu was waiting for him at Hakone. Bong goes to Iki's apartment to demand answers about what he had to do with Hakone. He says that Miharu was a street racer from the mountains of Hakone who had escaped the fear of death. He says Miharu was the only racer who had ever defeated him. In a flashback to that race, we see Miharu and Iki racing up a winding mountain road. They were so caught up in racing that they didn't notice an oncoming car. Iki survived by sledding on his brakes, but Miharu pulled away and left him there. Iki left Hakone after that. Iki says that we're headed to Hakone tomorrow. He says that if I wanted to know more about the fastest legend, there's someone in Hakone I could talk to. The eighth night takes place in Hakone, a small mountainous town south of Yokohama. It has three main roads, one of which you can't race on. All of this is explained to me in excruciating detail by the guy at the toll booth. My first order of business is to get that engine I wanted on night six. It's available again from another car here in Hakone. I'm also looking for a new chassis and a new car body. I drive around looking for it and I come across Kenzo being hounded by a dude from the Drift Dancers, Miharu's crew. I help him out and handily defeat them both. 
I land the car with my new chassis and body first. I have to find two of them because I want both the body and the chassis. I find another a little while later, and then I finally find the car with the engine I'm looking for. I have to go to the tune shop because I can't equip either the new body or the new chassis without some work. The chassis is incompatible with my current body, and the new body is incompatible with my current chassis. I have to modify my current body to support the new chassis, and then put the new body on after the new chassis. With all of these improvements, plus the turbos and superchargers I've gathered, my new car is terrifyingly fast. Even though I'm constantly slamming into walls, I still handily win races. It's also around this time that I finally realized that you can handbrake by pressing circle, which makes taking tight corners a lot easier. Eventually, I go meet up with the Drift Dancers. We meet Miharu for the first time in person. When the race starts, I easily take the lead with the new car, though I still struggle to not smash into walls quite so much. Next, it's up for my time on battle. It, again, it's not even remotely close, despite me constantly crashing into walls. I went up stealing his... exceptionally lightweight door? Next, it's time for the main event with Miharu and Iki. They talk for a while about Iki abandoning the scene at Hakone to go race in Yokohama. Iki wins the race, and they talk more about the Yokohama GP. Miharu tells Iki that Manabu has gotten back behind the wheel. We get an extended 8th night with our first midnight section. It opens with a monologue about needing to escape from under Iki's shadow. We learn that Iki left us a gift at Toon Shop Windy. I head over there immediately and finally meet the owner of the Toon Shop, KT. He challenges me to a race. Again, I beat him easily. He says I passed his test. Next, I head to the toll booth, where I run into Kenzo trying to head home. I learn that fog has moved in and it isn't safe to drive back to Yokohama yet. Then, I head up to the Holy Road, where I meet up with Yuka. We talk about Kyoji's accident. Bog asks her about the fastest legend, since he says nobody remembers him really. Everyone who raced is either missing or dead. Yuka drives away to head home. Bong is suddenly overcome by an anxiety that she might get hurt, or that Kenzo might get hurt. Manabu pulls up in his bright yellow car. At first I consider just battling him, but the game gives me a second chance to make the choice. I drive down the mountain to go check on Yuka and Kenzo. Everyone is blown away by how fast I drove. I head back up to the holy road. It's time to race Manabu. Bong monologues about how, uh, exposed Manabu's flank is. I beat him handily, but just before I cross the finish line, Iki shows up and speeds past both of us. We talk to Manabu. He tells Iki he should come back to Hakone. Iki demands to know what Manabu knows about the fastest legend. Iki confesses to hearing a voice in his head, just like Kyoji. Iki and I head to Toon Shop Windy. Bong wonders on the way why Iki didn't tell us earlier about the voice. KT shows me Iki's present for me. It's a fancy race car for the Yokohama GP. Immediately I think about how it's probably not as fast as the car I already have. KT wants to go for a drive with me. I take him up on the offer. We drive his car down the mountain road. KT says what he knows about the fastest legend. How it was a Zeta 3000 so tricked out it could obliterate anyone. How people said it was Diablo tuned. KT tells me that Kyoji 7 had also been Diablo tuned before it was driven into the ocean. KT gives us some, uh, encouragement for the GP. Bong has a dream that he's stuck underwater. In the dream, he hears a voice. A voice that demands speed. When I wake up, it's time for the GP. All the best street racers from around Japan are here. I quickly found out that I was exactly right about this car being slower than the car I already had. I suppose that makes the GP more exciting. It's on the same track as the qualifier. It takes me about an hour and a half of attempts to clear. I'm clearly faster than all the other cars. I just gotta stop smacking into walls so much. After I win the GP, all my friends go out to celebrate, but Bong doesn't. Instead, he's in the grandstands, feeling morose and lugubrious. Suddenly, Bong is visited by the ghosts of Makoto and Kyoji. I have a sudden flashback to a fiery tragedy that definitely doesn't remind me of any other PlayStation RPGs made by Squaresoft. 
Bong runs into the club where his friends are celebrating and punches Iki. I tear up the streets at ludicrous speeds, haunted by a voice that speaks in those funky Japanese double quote marks that they use in manga to indicate someone's talking over the phone. When Don comes, I find Iki. He challenges me to a race. It's close, but I pull away and never look back. As I come down the final straightaway, though, Iki takes the corner behind me and flips his car. The voice visits Bong again, congratulating him on vanquishing his enemy. While lying in my arms, Iki confesses his fears about the voice, how he can't escape it. He warns that Bong can't escape it either. Bong has another vision of the fiery wreck on the highway. The voice explains that it was Yokohama's fastest legend. Yuka wakes me from my reverie by calling me on the phone. Bong throws his phone into the ocean, and the voice manifests before me. I ask who it is, and it says it was me. I ask it several other questions, but it refuses to answer. Finally, I ask if it killed my friends. It says yes. The voice is gone. I decide to head back to Hakone to see if anyone knows more than they're letting on. I know Hakone was south of Yokohama, so I head south on the highway, but then it turns out that heading in the opposite direction of North Yokohama actually puts me on the highway north to Tokyo. As soon as I get on the highway, I get roped in this weird Gymkhana thing? I have no idea what this is. The good news is that while I'm here, I can steal a valuable twin turbo part from Nanako. After that diversion, I'm finally ready to head to Hakone. I drive up to the Holy Road and see Miharu and Manabu driving up the mountain pass. I meet up with them when they're done. I race Miharu first and take him down in what turned out to be a pretty close race. I'm visited by the voice again after the race. It takes over Bong's body and speaks to Manabu through him. I take on Manabu and the race is much less close. Manabu says that he's got a terminal illness. He says that he had to forget what happened 10 years ago because everyone who hasn't forgotten is dead. He explains that in order to find out the answers to my questions, I need to learn the secret of Diablo 2 by going to visit a man far north in Hokkaido. I had more questions for the voice and again it refused to answer. The only way to find out more was to head north. I got back control of my body and headed for Hokkaido. While on the highway, the racing crew who controls the highway, the C1 Road Stars, gets in my way. The C1 is the ring road around central Tokyo. They demand a race. I clobber them again and steal their turbos. Gamal, the leader of the C1 Road Stars, explains why he wanted to race me so bad. He wanted a chance to get his car Diablo tuned. Before he could explain, another guy shows up driving an SUV. He says I remind him of the fastest legend. He says the fastest legend is dead. He provides context to Bong's fiery visions, explaining that the fastest legend had been in a multi-car pileup that killed every racer involved. He refers to the era of the fastest legend as the War of Yokohama. Then he wants a race. I toasted him too and continued on to Hokkaido. I arrive at my destination, Forget Hill. I have to get to the summit. I buy some snow tires at the tune shop and head up the mountain. When I reach the top, I meet a man whose outfit and environment make him look like he walked in from an entirely different game. The voice takes over Bong's body again and says he remembers this guy. We hear cars outside, apparently I've been followed. He hands me a mini disc, but the voice doesn't give a shit. The voice threatens to kill him. Uh, my guy, it is not a floppy disk, that's clearly a mini disk, which is an entirely different and vastly superior format. With that iridescence, it's clearly an optical disk in that cassette, not a magnetic one. It's time to escape down the mountain, the first course in the game where you can fall off the edge, which I do, obviously. I eventually make it down the mountain, and my car tumbles off the cliff and lands in a snowbank. On the cliff above, I see the weird man from the top of the mountain get shot by the guy who was watching my race after I won the GP. 
I demand answers from the voice, but I get nothing again. Eventually, the voice retreats, and I return to Yokohama. When I'm nearly home, I pick up a strange broadcast on the radio. Soon, there are cars in front of me, blocking my path. These two guys come out of the cars and introduce themselves as John Truth and Forza Rush. They demand the minidisc. Men in black emerge from a limo to take it by force. They invite me to something called the Darkness GP and drive away. I head straight for the Darkness GP. I finally meet the man who we've seen a few times now. He introduces himself as Schneider. He explains the competition, and I waste no time and get right into it. Despite the ominous name and setup, the race itself isn't very challenging. I take an early lead and never relinquish it. After winning, it's revealed there's another phase, the Darkness GP Diablo. I'm up against five Diablo-tuned cars of mysterious provenance. This race is much harder. The other cars are fast, and it's only with good driving skill that I can overtake them. This race is five laps on the Yokohama GP track, though starting from a different location than during the GP. After a few attempts, I eventually get a commanding lead and walk away with the win, and the Diablo Tune Arrow Kit. Suddenly, Bong remembers the Diablo Zeta. Bong remembers the Inferno on the freeway more clearly than ever before. Before he gets too lost in thought, John Truth and Forza Rush knock on my window. They offer to divulge the contents of the mini-disc. The voice tells them it doesn't care. I race again, time on style, against the Diablo Zeta. Again, it's close. Without my car Diablo tuned, I can barely inch past the Zeta with excellent driving. I give in and Diablo tune my car. It's like night and day. I pull away easily and obliterate the Zeta. When I win, the driver gets out of the Diablo Zeta. To my surprise, it's Iki. The voice returns to Bong. It compels him to try to remember. He flashes back to the Inferno again. He speeds off. The voice is stolen his body. Bong finds himself in a run-down back alley garage full of what looks like blood. After I've awoken in a daze, two cars pull up. It's Gamal of the C1 Roadstars and Keisuke of the Night Racers. They tell me that this garage is the Diablo Tune Shop, and they've come to kill me. Bong goes to reach for a tire iron to fight them off, and suddenly he has a vision of a memory. He sees an apartment. When he comes to, Keisuke and Gamo are hurt, and a limo has pulled up to the garage. Truth and Rush get out in chloroform him, and he passes out. Bong awakens again to... the smell of men, apparently. When Bong opens his eyes, he's in the dark, stuffed in the trunk of the limo. He passes out again. In his dream, I see the apartment again. There's a woman showering while Bong sits in the living room with a container full of pills on the coffee table. Eventually, Bong comes to in the Wontek boardroom. Schneider is here, as is the CEO of Wontek, Wan Lee. They explain to me the truth about Diablo Tune, which I will now relate to you with the promise that I am not making any of this up. Diablo Tune is not, as it turns out, a thing you do to a car. It is instead a pill you take that removes fear from your mind. Wontek was developing it to allow mankind to transcend fear and anxiety and reach its true potential. They decided that the best test subjects for this technology would be street racers. Overcoming fear allowed these street racers to achieve unparalleled speeds, but at a price. Their lack of fear invariably led to their deaths. This was not only responsible for the war of Yokohama and the crash on the freeway, but also the death of Kyoji's elder brother. With the crash on the freeway, Wontek declared the project a total loss and put it on ice for 10 years. Schneider then explains that Bong is the last remaining driver from the Diablo tests, and he's been asleep for 10 years. When Bong comes to, Kenzo is pulling his car down the street. Kenzo's car is smashed and he's beat up. He says they've taken all of Bong's other friends to Belagoon Tower for a new experiment. I head over there immediately, and it is there that I learn a rather important piece of information. Nanako was working for Wontek the whole time to try to get me to do unofficial races. They aren't going to let me into Belagoon Tower until I've achieved the rank of Yokohama's fastest. 
I have no idea what this entails. The walkthrough is my mummy issue of what exactly it takes to be Yokohama's fastest. At this point, I am genuinely worried that I have to complete every single unofficial race in the game. I assume that they were optional and the walkthrough doesn't specify because it assumes you want to do all of them. Some of the unofficial races are going to require parts I no longer have access to because they were only available on previous nights. Undeterred, I try my best. I go to Ancient Bay where I can check my rank. I'm an up-and-comer. I need to prove I'm the fastest legend. I do every race Nautico offers. I have to go and buy or steal every type of drivetrain in the game for all the different drivetrain cups. I have to drive all the way out to Hakone to get my car's body modified to accept any kind of drivetrain. Before the no turbo class race, I struggle for a minute before I remember my engine has twin turbos built in. I go and race with Miharu while I'm in Hakone, and he says a bunch of weird shit, and then I realize that I already have the turbo he has, so I can't steal his. I search for a new turbo over on the highway, but the car I need to steal it from is too fast, and I can't flash my headlights at it. I head to the third Keihin to do the unofficial races there. I head to Yokohama Stadium to do the unofficial races there. I go to North Yokohama again to buy a part to make my car heavier so I can participate in the heavyweight race at Yokohama Stadium. I try to get my car heavy enough to participate in the hyperweight race, including equipping the bus car body, because you can race buses in this game, but it turns out it blocks the view too bad to race with. Instead, I do the over 800 PS race at Yokohama Stadium, which turns out to be a 20 lap endurance race. I seriously spent this entire race going, surely this is the last lap. Then, I head to Honmoku Wharf and do all the unofficial races with the Night Racers. Then, I go to Chinatown and do all the unofficial races with the Queens. I return to Spencer's test course and use the old arrow kit I got from the Queens to win the old cup. I check the menu. It still says I'm a supreme racer. I don't know if it updates without me having to go to Ancient Bay. I drive to the end of the road. I hold my breath as I park. It's confirmed. I am Yokohama's fastest. I pump my fist. I head over to Bay Lagoon. It's time to end this. They chloroform me again and I'm taken deep underground. When Bong awakes, we are once again in a room that looks like it was taken from a completely different game. Schneider and Juan explained to me that I've just been woken up from the Matrix or something. I, I was asleep the whole time? I was placed into D-sleep. Now I am an artificial consciousness that was created out of false memories in order to reduce the trauma of waking up after 10 years of suspended animation. But the real consciousness is waking up. And that's the voice I've been hearing. And the voice that the other drivers heard was the voice of Diablo. Or something. The voice takes control of Bong's body. I see through his eyes what he's done. He's killed Keisuke and Gamo. In the next room, I find a prison cell containing all the drivers from 10 years ago. Suddenly, Bong awakes and the building is self-destructing. Yuka and Akira are here. It's time to escape via the least high-octane driving in this entire game. This section of the game is roughly like trying to exit a parking garage in a Bugatti. Bong tries to figure out where Iki is, and he commits to saving him. Saving him looks an awful lot like what I was already doing, which is getting myself Austin Powers in an exploding building. I escape to the surface. Schneider's here. He's killed Juan. Schneider explains the real truth that was on the minidisc. Bong was never a Diablo driver. They preserved him by mistake. He also explains that the man we met in Hokkaido was the scientist who put us to sleep. After Schneider is done evil monologuing, we have a race. I fall off the edge of the track a lot. This might be annoyance, I am glad to no longer have to negotiate a parking garage in a car that goes from 0 to 100 in half a second. Schneider drives into the ocean. When I emerge out of the surface streets, I see Iki's Diablo tuned car. His girlfriend Ali gets out. She reveals that she was the one who recruited racers for the Diablo project, doing so because of a twisted hatred of street racers due to a car accident that killed her parents, which is a villain motivation so cliche I almost stopped playing the game, deleted all of my footage, and abandoned this video project. She tells me to try to get Bong to take Diablo 2, but he refused. He became the fastest legend because he refused to take Diablo and still outraced all the Diablo tuned cars. After Aoi revealed her deception, 
Bong went out to the highway and caused the wreck that we've been flashing back to, bringing an end to Diablo Tune. Bong contemplates his erstwhile headmate and the future ahead of him. Then we have another race against Iki, who is still haunted by Diablo. Just as I round the first corner, however, I remember talking to him after his accident. I remember him telling me he has no regrets. When I come to, I have to chase down Aoi. When I finally outrace her, Racing Lagoon is a flawed game. I completely understand why it wouldn't have been a high priority for translation. I haven't talked about the original Japanese script so far, but it is bonkers using a mixture of Japanese and English with highly stylized use of punctuation that must have seemed like more trouble than it was worth to translate. In my research for writing about this game, I read two English language reviews, one by Kimimi the Game Eating She Monster and one by Joe B for Hardcore Gaming 101. Both of these sites are phenomenal resources for information about Japanese game obscurities, by the way. Kimimi lamented the game's complexity and impenetrability to the player unfamiliar with cars. I sympathize immensely. I know nothing about cars. I doubt I would have been able to finish this game without a guide. The vast array of customization options is astonishing and overwhelming. As I played more, however, I came to see things more from the perspective of the Hardcore Gaming 101 review. Joe criticizes the game for being overly simplistic, lacking the detailed car modeling of Gran Turismo 2 or the deep arcade action of Ridge Racer. What I eventually came to realize was that very little about your car setup actually mattered besides raw engine power. So the most optimal car setup was to get the most powerful available engine and stuff it full of as many turbos as you can fit. After night 8, only about halfway through the game, I no longer found any of the races particularly challenging because I upgraded my car so much. Ultimately, I think I'm glad the game erred on the side of overly simplistic. The game's willingness to let you lose some races at first had me excited at the narrative design potential of a racing game RPG. It reminded me of Pyre, Supergiant's failed experiment in a narrative sports fantasy game that nonetheless compelled me with its promise vastly more than any other game they've made. Racing the Goon's least interesting aspect is its inconsistency in this regard. It is willing to let you lose some races, but it's not interested in making a game where you can lose any race and letting the player have control over the story. I'm not, however, overly interested in meticulously cataloging the game's design failures. Instead, I want to document how this game made me feel. One of the things I find most fascinating about Racing Lagoon, and indeed almost all racing media, as a person who's not driven a car in almost 10 years, is the notion of the driver as the most important agent in a race. As I played the game, I did improve at racing, but I slammed into walls constantly when I started playing the game, and I slammed into walls constantly when I finished the game. The difference was that I finished the game with a powerful engine full of turbos that put me so far in the lead that my ineptitude didn't matter. In most ways, I did not improve at racing. My car did. Despite this, I am still Yokohama's fastest legend. The Diablo tune is not something you do to a car, it's something you do to the person driving the car. When Yokohama's fastest legend defeated the Diablo Zetas, it was not because his car was superior to the tricked out high-end supercars distributed by Wantech, but because of his superior will. 
In a way, I admire this focus on human agency. The car can't drive itself. The car makes nothing happen. I have an adverse relationship with cars. I don't know how to drive. I tried to learn as a teenager, but after I failed my driver's test for a second time by going the wrong way down a two-lane road with a median on it, I decided that driving wasn't for me. When I was in middle school, I lived in a suburban neighborhood that put me within walking distance of many of my friends, an enormous strode with stores and restaurants, and a large local park. When I got to high school, my parents relocated us to a house in a different suburban neighborhood out in the middle of nowhere. While living there, I attempted to walk to the nearest convenience store with my brother and my best friend. It looked roughly doable on the map, but it took over an hour, and by the time we arrived it was dark and we had to call our parents to take us home. The entire trip, we were harassed by several teens circling by repeatedly in an SUV to scream homophobic slurs at us. I consider this experience, of moving from a place where I could just leave the house to do things to a place where it took 45 minutes of being screamed at by passing teens just to get to a small strip mall, central to the formation of my current politics. Not only my interest in urbanism and public transportation, but the fundamental truth that nobody, not even your parents, actually cares about what is best for you unless you have the power to force them to. Mao Zedong was right. All of this is to say I have long regarded cars with hostility. I experience people enthusiastically talking about cars in the same way I experience people enthusiastically talking about guns. That is to say, I feel as though car enthusiasts must inhabit an alternate reality to mine, one in which cars have not destroyed all our walkable urban spaces while slowly rendering the planet uninhabitable with their exhaust gases. I can scarcely comprehend how one could live a life in which that is not the first thing you think of when you see a car. How our miserable lives being gradually choked out by automotive and fossil fuel interests couldn't possibly be the dominating presence in your mind. There is one exception, though. I love racing games. I have elsewhere declared that the three things I enjoy most in video games, while believing they simply should not exist in real life, are cars, guns, and golf. Racing video games provide a window into that alternate reality. Racing Lagoon's Yokohama has no pedestrians. It has no traffic that is not enthusiastically willing and able to race. Its races feature no physical danger except at appropriate plot-mandated moments. This Yokohama has no mayor, no city council, no planning commission, no highway engineers. It is eternal and unchanging, frozen as a pristine playground for cars where humans have no place. When I play Racing Lagoon, I experience this world for myself through the eyes of a car. When I step outside of my apartment, I find myself in the same world as a pedestrian. I love so much about Racing Lagoon. I love its bold use of animation and effects to bring life to its text. I love its completely unhinged script. I love the music, oh my god, the music! I think you should play it. If nothing else, Racing Lagoon is an odd design dead end that must be experienced to be believed. Nobody's ever made anything quite like it. Thanks for watching! If you liked the video, hit the like button, and subscribe if you haven't already. These videos are supported by viewers like you over at patreon.com slash profit underscore goddess, where you can get access to my Discord, director's commentary on every video I make, and your name in the credits of videos. 